seminar series. Uh, today we're going to explore the important role landscapes have in our watersheds. Uh, I would like to invite those that are in the room or in this building that we have these wonderful guides, uh, watershed approach to landscape design in the back. Uh, it has Northern California and Southern California examples. Uh, uh, so pick one up. They're a wonderful resource. Uh, some announcements first. In case of emergency, please gather your belongings. Go out the back doors. You'll see the stairs down those stairs, out the front doors, and we meet in Cesar Chavez Park across the street. Uh, restrooms, a little bit complicated. They, if you go to the right and snake around the uh, elevator bank, you'll find a hallway that runs this way. Uh, there are restrooms on either side of that. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available after, afterwards with the 14 other storm seminars. Uh, and that will be at uh, waterboards.ca.gov backslash storms. You'll see a little stormwater seminar uh, tab that you can click on and find them there. Uh, for those that are watching online, I think we have it on the screen. Uh, you can email questions to storms at waterboard.ca.gov, uh, and we'll try to get to all your questions. If not, we'll email you after. Uh, for those that don't know, the Storm Seminar Series is an open forum to feature new research, technologies, policies, and news relating to stormwater. Uh, it is, we feature all things that support our mission of advancing the perspective that stormwater is a valuable resource. If you have a storm seminar that you'd like to put on, you can email us and we'll try to work with you to put something together. Uh, today, we have uh, Pamela uh, Burstler. Uh, she's the executive director of the Pacific Horticulture Society and the co-founder and CEO of Green Gardens Group, G3. Uh, through these programs, Pamela promotes the principles that every landscape can be utilized to create soil and water security as well as resilient communities. Uh, Pamela has also written six uh, watershed approach to landscapes handbooks, which we have one in the back. Um, also joining us by phone is Mara Diaz. She's from Surfrider. Uh, she manages their volunteer water quality monitoring program, the Blue Water Task Force, and the Ocean Friendly Gardens program. Uh, she works with homeowners, professionals, and elected officials on sustainable uh, landscaping practices that conserve water resources and protects local waterways from polluted runoff. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Pamela. Thank you so much, Matt. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody who has tuned in on the internet. Sorry you can't join the 200 people here in the room. 
I think that honesty is the best policy. <laughs> so I wanted to start out just by saying that my perspective on all of this is from the point of view of really a tree hugger, from someone who did not come from the environmental world, who didn't come from the science world. Uh, I'm coming to it with a layperson's perspective and had to grow into it. Uh, and so a lot of what I do and what my organization does is try to translate really complex ideas into more simple ideas that everybody can implement. So um, hopefully you will see that as we go forward. Um, I wanted to quickly tell you just a little bit about G3, which is the organization that I founded uh, along with some other people about 10 years ago. And really everything you're gonna be seeing today has been in the works for 10 years. Um, everything we do is uh, oriented toward building critical thinking and site evaluation, thinking of whole sites. Uh, we actually have a professional training program that is EPA WaterSense certifying. Uh, we're a certified uh, a professional certifying organization. Hard to get those, that acronym right. But anyway, it's called the Watershed Wise Landscape Professional, and it is the only uh, outdoor water use efficiency training that emphasizes the whole watershed approach to landscaping. Um, we are uh, also do training for property owners and maintenance training. We've built um, a suite of hands-on workshops, which are actually in the field training where people are going out and building gardens and learning about it hands-on. Uh, professionals together with the property owners. Uh, the slides that you're seeing here are actually from Surfrider programs that we've done in various places, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, we really believe that we have to get professionals, scientists, policymakers, property owners, everybody out into the garden to understand how simple the transition steps are to move from what we have now to something that is really a regenerative and resilient landscape. Um, our property owners get excited when they are engaged in this way by so many different people. They get on board and then they go out and recruit others to get on board. They actually, we've developed a program with Surfrider, which Mara will talk about, where we do these neighborhood walks and people get out and actually walk their neighborhood with their neighbors and talk about what they did differently and offer ideas about what people could do differently in their properties. Um, we also, as Matt said, we've created a lot of local standards and metrics, mostly here in California. We have six guidance documents right now. Uh, the, mo the first one that we did was for Surfrider Foundation, was creating their ocean-friendly gardens uh, sign criteria and sort of the principles of their program. And then the most recent project that we did was the California Watershed Approach to Landscaping Guidebook for the whole state for the Association of Professional Landscape Designers and California Water Efficiency Partnership and Surfrider. Okay, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mara to introduce herself if she is ready to roll. Hello, you hear me fine? Yeah, we hear you. Excellent. So thank you, Pam. Um, I think if you, you go from our first slide, which just shows our logo to the next one, you know, I just wanted to start by describing, you know, who is Surfrider? Why do we care about gardens? Um, we are a nonprofit grassroots organization really dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of our world's ocean waves and beaches. On the next slide, you'll see you know, who we really are is just people who love the beach. Yes, we're surfers, but some of us are swimmers. Some of us like to play volleyball or just sit in the sand. We want to make sure the beaches remain accessible and also clean and healthy for us to enjoy and our family to enjoy. So we take that love of the beach and we really turn it into um, stewardship. So we, are, we do beach cleanups. We plant beach grass. We do all, all sorts of activities to really protect the quality of that special place. And if you look at how we're organized on the next slide, you'll see we've got, this slide's actually a little old, we're probably about over 150 volunteer-run chapters and school clubs 
nationwide in all of these coastal states that are highlighted blue. So it's a pretty large network of volunteers that are supported by a, a very small staff nationally. On the next slide, you'll see these are the issue areas that we really work on in order to meet our mission of protecting and enjoying our ocean waves and beaches. Um, what I'll be talking about today is our clean water initiative, which on the next slide, you'll see what we're really aimed at is protecting water quality, both in local waterways and to reduce ocean pollution so it's safe to surf, swim, play in the ocean. On the next slide, you know, whether a great day at the beach looks like these beautiful waves here, or maybe on the next slide you prefer to just lounge more in the the calm, warm waters. Or maybe on the next slide, you'll see you like to paddle, you know, upstream and be in the fresh waters, enjoying those environments. But the point is, wherever you play in the ocean, you should be able to do that and not worry about having to get sick from pollution. So on the next slide, we started our Blue Water Task Force Volunteer Water Testing Program about over 20 years ago. So we had more information for coastal communities. So we knew where it was safe to play at the the beach and when we identified problems we could bring together the community to implement solutions. On the next slide um, we'll see that no matter where we test around the country storm water and urban runoff are really the biggest source of pollution um, at, at the beach. You know agent, health agencies are forced to issue advisories and beach closures to keep people from getting sick, from exposure to polluted water. But when we looked at where are the solutions, we really needed to turn around and look back upstream because really the solutions for stormwater runoff are land-based. And we realized we needed more holistic management of both our landscapes and our water resources to address stormwater runoff. And this is really what led us to working with Pamela and working on you know, the Ocean Friendly Gardens program, and which incorporates the watershed approach, which I think she's going to talk about now. I am. Thank you so much, Mara. Welcome. So, you know, this is kind of funny standing here in this room uh, and asking the question, watershed, what's that? Uh, if I were standing in a room of water supply people and uh, even... Um, people who are uh, with NGOs and so forth and said, oh, yeah, it's a watershed approach. There's a little bit of a disconnect. You know, why? Why are you calling it that? You know, it's such a weird word to apply, especially coming from a water conservation or water use efficiency point of view. Um, but really what we're doing is we're taking the paradigm of a balanced, healthy watershed. And, you know, we we think we all know what that means, but I'm just going to take a second to highlight the things that I think it, are most important here. And that is that um, in the balanced watershed, we have all these cycling, you know, all these very you know perfect cyclings happening. We have carbon, nitrogen, water vapor. Uh, it's coming from the sky in the form of precipitation, and then it passes through a living system. And that's really important, and a terrestrial living system. And uh, the water is absorbed into the plants and into the soil. And then that soil and plant system actually manages the way that that water moves through the rest of the cycle. And so that water then begins to uh, be pulled by gravity down into groundwater or pulled through capillary action across into uh, creeks and rivers and so forth. But it it moves through that living system before it reaches the waterways. And this is a really important thing for us to remember as humans have begun to act on the watershed uh, and make changes to the watershed because that perfect system has now been kind of thrown out of whack. And a part of this balanced system that I think is really important for us to keep in mind is the other side of the equation. We often talk about, from watershed point of view, the water protection of the water being cleaned through terrestrial systems before it goes into water. But we don't talk a lot about the other part of the equation, which is that those same terrestrial systems recycle the water back into the atmosphere at, through evapotranspiration. 
And it turns out that that evapotranspiration is actually an incredibly important part of not only uh, the balance of, for climate change uh, and weather con uh, conversation, but also just, um, you know, pretty much all life on the planet uh, has to or relies on this evapotranspiration process. And this is hugely overlooked uh, when we talk about why we would be doing watershed, watershed approach. And one of the things that was appealing about this idea of the watershed is that it's a completely scalable model. We can think about the watershed on the very large scale, the mountains, the rivers, the, you know, the, the whole thing that comes to mind, like where we would all like to be right now, right? Or you could actually scale that idea down to be a community or to be a front yard. And in fact, we can even think about every roof as though it were a watershed, because really, what is a watershed? It's an area of land where all the water that falls on it and all the water under it drains to the same place. And so the, using the watershed approach allows us to have this scalable model for evaluation of landscapes and also for discovering and utilizing regenerative practices to heal that landscape no matter what the size is and no matter what the land use is. So that's the whole purpose of it. There are four principles to the watershed approach to landscaping. And the first and most important one is that we grow healthy living soil. Soil is the great moderator of pretty much everything that we've been talking about. And um, we have to create that living soil in order to have all these other benefits that we talk about in the healthy, balanced uh, water cycle. The second thing is that we passively capture rainwater in that soil. And this is really important for us to distinguish between capturing in devices and so forth or passively capture. When we say passively capture, we mean we are directing the water into the landscape for the benefit of the landscape first, and then for the benefit of waterways or groundwater or whatever after that. The third thing is that we select climate appropriate plants. So these are plants that are adapted to our climate for sure, but actually um, very closely adapted to our our, our uh, climate, in fact, perhaps even have evolved with the climate so that we're looking at a lot of native plants and a lot of um, plants that have been here for a very, very long time. Uh, and really, something for us to keep in mind is that the whole process of the watershed approach is really about selecting plants for root growth. We want to have as much root growth as we possibly can. We want to maximize root growth. And there's a reason for that, but we'll, which I'll get to in a second. And then the fourth thing is uh, we want to use highly efficient supplemental irrigation. So that means the irrigation happens only when it's necessary. It's highly efficient. In order to be efficient, irrigation has to be designed, installed, and managed efficiently. That's a tall order, actually. So if we can avoid utilizing irrigation, that's the most efficient thing we can do. But then if we have to utilize it, we make sure that it is designed, managed, and, and installed properly. And also, we think about the sources of the irrigation water. So we try to utilize rainwater that has been captured actively, or gray water, or some other source before we're utilizing potable water. So that's something for us to be thinking about. Those are the four principles of the watershed approach to landscaping. And what's really cool is back in March, the UN published this, uh, which you're all familiar with, undoubtedly, um, this wonderful document essentially saying, look, if we are going to combat climate change, we have to figure out how to use nature-based solutions to do it. They're the most economical. They're the ones that can be the most ubiquitously implemented. They are um, easy to <laughs> implement. Uh, and uh, the part that I think is particularly interesting about this is this idea that we are actually focusing on soil moisture retention. Now, this is a little bit different of an objective from what we usually think about with stormwater, where the emphasis is on infiltration to groundwater or cleaning it before it goes into a waterway. But really, what we're talking about here is that in order to combat climate change, we want to find a way to retain moisture in our soil. 
Well, there's really only one way to do that, and that is to put it into what I like to call the soil moisture reservoir. And the soil moisture reservoir is essentially the root depth of plants. So here we have the UN saying, hey, what do we need to do to combat climate change? We need to convert ornamental landscapes into something else. So uh, I probably should have clipped this uh, sooner, but here we go. So what we're going to be concentrating on in, this, in these solutions is, on the one hand, the soil and the root, de root depth of the plants to hold on to moisture so it can be evapotranspired. And on the other side, making sure that evapotranspiration is happening and that it's coming from the soil moisture and not from irrigation water that we're just uh, pumping out of the ground or importing from some other watershed. So this is really our goal. Our goal is to absolutely flip the idea of an ornamental landscape from being a turf-centric or even a landscape that might have plants that are adapted to a climate but that, is, that aren't focused on um, being watershed-wise to landscapes that are absolutely watershed-wise and that implement these four principles. Okay, so I am tasked with kind of breaking down a little bit of the sort of technical aspects to this because I've given this talk maybe a hundred times and Ocean Friendly Gardens has given this talk many, many times. But over the last 10 years, we've been able to really kind of piece the story together to start making sense across all the silos of science and policymaking and everything else and really bring back why ornamental landscapes are so important when they are, in fact, one of the greatest overlooked sources, right? You know, we, we, we tend to think of them almost as a third rail, you know, an ornamental landscape. I don't want to tell people what to do in their landscape, but yet, it is one of our most powerful tools. So I thought I'd just take a second to try to piece it all together as a story for you. And I'm gonna start with the story of how much water a landscape requires in California. So in California, um, on average, if you're at the beach, uh, it requires less water. And as you go inland into drier climate, it requires a lot more water. But on average, it's about 50 inches a year of water is required by an ornamental landscape that is dominated by turf. So that's 50 inches um, you know, of supplemental irrigation, basically. That's in addition to rainwater. And the thing is, and I know this is a little hard to see, but this is, uh, uh, as a result, uh, DWR has this wonderful um, California irrigation management information system, and um, it reports throughout the state how, you know, uh, how much water, turf, cool season grass needs. And basically what you see here is that most of this water is actually required, surprise, surprise, in the dry part of the summer when the days are long and things are hot. And during those months, we find that a typical turf-covered ornamental landscape is going to require something around five inches per month of water to almost 10 inches, in fact, yeah, 10 inches of water per month. So that is, does that come up? There we go, yeah. So this is in the month of July. A ornamental landscape is requiring five inches of water at a minimum or 10 inches at a maximum. And so basically it turns out to be more than an inch a week that is required by an ornamental landscape. All right, now here's the thing. Most of those landscapes that are turf dominant are irrigated by spray irrigation systems. Spray irrigation systems deliver water in gallons per minute, but what's really important about them is that they are not incredibly efficient. Brand new ones are, you know, pretty efficient at 75% efficiency. But most of the older ones, which are the ones that we're really kind of talking about, are somewhere around 50% or even lower. That means that that one inch of water or more that is required every week in the summertime, it actually needs two inches. It needs twice as much water because the irrigation system is inefficient. So now we're applying 
two inches of water per week to the landscape in the summertime with a turf-based landscape. And now something else for us to think about is the fact that the application rate of those irrigation systems is really fast. So these spray systems are putting out the water at three quarters of an inch per hour to an inch and a half per hour and sometimes even more. So I want you to think about that now. We have in California all these landscapes that are getting delivered to them every week in one or two applications a week at a rate of three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half per hour, regardless of soil type, right? So this is in clay places or sandy places, it doesn't matter. Fast amount of water being applied to the soil and a lot of it, two inches, in order to keep that green grass happy. Okay, hopefully you stormwater people are shaking in your boots because you're thinking, my gosh, we're applying every week, we're applying an inch of water at three quarters to an inch and a half per uh, inches per hour. That's uh, kind of crazy, okay? So this means that California turf landscapes are getting about 100 inches a year of potable water, mostly potable water. It's delivered weekly in the summertime and at an application rate of three quarters to an inch and a half per hour. Okay, that is a crazy landscape that a, a person who is managing a watershed would not want to have that unless they had some sandy engineered soil retention basin in order to do that, right? This is not, this is not your typical uh, well-designed landscape from a stormwater point of view, yet this is the California typical turf-based landscape. And so, all of that water that's being delivered in irrigation is intending to keep the root zone of the plants wet. That's the whole purpose of irrigation, keeping a root zone wet. Any water that goes below that or away from that or on the sidewalk or whatever is wasted water. And so we want to just keep this root zone wet. So that's why we have to apply so much water with those inefficient systems. And because of it, we end up getting dry weather runoff. Surprise, surprise. We have clay soils out there, right? We have places that are surrounded by hardscape. And so these irrigation systems end up creating huge amounts of dry weather runoff um, just because there's, there's no way to avoid it. Then in the winter time, when it actually is raining, we actually dehydrate the landscape by making sure that all of the rainwater that might want to be gathered from hard surfaces is taken off of the landscape instead of put into the landscape to sort of recharge that soil moisture reservoir when it's coming from the sky. And that means that we get runoff, we get flooding, we have to deal with wet weather runoff as a result of that. On top of it all, in order to keep this landscape happy, we're applying fertilizers and pesticides and all that sort of thing, utilizing a lot of fossil fuels in order to maintain that landscape. Um, certainly the fertilizers are not staying in place, especially with all that irrigation that's being applied to them. We are developing landscapes, ornamental landscapes, along with our living development and destroying the habitat that used to be in that area. So now we don't have the habitat benefits either. We're taking all the organic carbon off of the lands. Is everybody getting bummed out? <laughs> We're taking all the organic carbon off of the landscape by like taking that green waste away instead of leaving it in place or actually adding organic carbon to the landscape. We treat our soil like dirt because we're building, so we compact it. That means it has no soil structure. So that contributes even more to erosion and to problems with the weather, you know, with the dry and wet weather runoff. And that compaction, that killing of the soil microbes leads to something called desertification, especially in areas that are called uh, semi-arid, Mediterranean, and steppe climates, which predominate California's climates. So here we have a situation where we are killing the soil, we're pumping groundwater or importing it from other people's watersheds to put it onto the land so it can run off. The plants don't get the benefit of it. And, um, you know, it's a pretty nasty cycle, really. Um, 
And what ends up happening in a big picture is we can start to look at what happens to this root zone water. So remember I said that root zone water is sort of the purpose of irrigation? Well, actually that root zone water is the most important thing that we could be concentrating on because it is the manager of our climate, of our weather certainly. And so what we see is, and we can get into this more later, is that by doing all this stuff to our landscapes and, util and, and managing these ornamental landscapes the way we do, we basically are creating giant heat islands in our cities, in our suburbs, and uh, we are taking water out of groundwater to create these giant heat islands. And so over time, we've created something really nefarious. Not only do we not have well-hydrated, shallow root zone areas, but we also now begin to have shallow groundwater depletion as well. And this actually contributes, again, as I said, to heat island effect, which has a weather impact by thwarting gentle rain cycles when they come. All of this comes back to ornamental landscape practices and could we do that differently? And so we had to step back and say, wait a second, what we've learned over the last 10 years is that ornamental landscapes are actually the very central part of the fight against climate change that every single property owner, every single property steward, anybody who's making a decision about any area of land could participate in reversing the climate change and actually regenerating the watershed function of a place. And because it's out there, it's, a, it's just landscape. And so we want to step back and say, okay, how do we make that happen? And one of the first things we got involved with was the Ocean Friendly Gardens Project. And the Ocean Friendly Gardens Project was the first place where we began to understand that if we're talking about outdoor water use efficiency, so now I'm talking now from a more conservation point of view. If we, if we talk about outdoor water use efficiency, we need to shift our focus from just talking about irrigation use efficiency and, and making sure that you know, we don't hose down driveways and all that sort of thing. And we need to actually start to think about, well, how can that landscape be converted into something that has rainwater use efficiency? So basically taking the, a stormwater kind of problem or a stormwater issue and now bringing it over to water conservation, not just in giant infiltration areas, in urban areas, but now in every single person's landscape. We can ask the question, is this landscape Ha, does this landscape have rainwater use efficiency, good rainwater use efficiency? And that's really what we uh, started to do. And we understood that plants themselves are in control of their environment. If we just give them some organic matter, if we just decompact their environment, if we just give them rainwater, we actually can get a carbon cycle jump started that would begin to sequester a lot of carbon in the root zone, which is hydrophilic, which means that we can start holding on to more water, no matter what kind of soil we have, whether it's sand, silt, or clay. And really begin to rely on plants to be their own carbon farmers, to be their own water farmers. Like let the plants start to do their thing, give them the tools. Um, I don't know why the title didn't work, but what, I, what this is really showing is that we want to start to focus on building soil structure everywhere that we possibly can. Um, and the way that we build soil structure is by including organic matter in the soil and by planting plants that are appropriate to the site so that they create a root depth that is deep. And you can see in this picture that in these four containers, we have two different soil samples from two different places. On the, on the, uh, the two people on the left have soil that was taken out of a field. The very far left is soil that was taken as a sample off of an area where a tractor went back and forth. The other sample right next to the same field, but in an area where there was no compaction. And you can see, what is the difference there? Why is one falling apart when it goes into water? Well, that's soil structure. And that soil structure is a sponge. 
And that sponge holds on to water when it's dry and releases water when it's wet. And you can see right there that that difference, same type of soil, completely different structure. And then the same thing for the two people on the right. Those soil samples are out of a field and they're the same or out of a, a, a site where it's the same site, but two completely different behaviors. And that's because of soil structure. Soil structure needs to become the thing that we talk about with stormwater management and with landscape management, not just soil type. Because this, this allows us to begin to think about making um, watershed approach landscapes in every single place, again, regardless of soil type. We hold on to the rain in our new gardens. And of course, you all know that we get 600 gallons uh, for every 1,000 square foot of roof or 1,000 square foot of um, hard surface. And that can be a lot of water from a water conservation point of view. But more importantly, it's a lot of water kept out, out of the um, hard surfaces running off into the waterways. And more importantly, the plants need it when it comes. So we're giving them that water. The soil is the biggest cistern that we could ever create. We could never ever economically or feasibly put um, rain barrels or, or cisterns in place to hold as much water as we can hold in soil, which can hold up to eight times the amount of water as all of the lakes and rivers and streams and everything that we have um, out there. So soil is the huge cistern. Uh, it is a carbon dense system. The plants have uh, built it. It's a giant sponge and it's sequestering five to six times the carbon mass of the plant. So you take the plant out and, and look at the carbon that's in just that plant. Five to six times that amount is actually sequestered in the soil at the root zone or below it by, by that plant. And in terms of soil, uh, moisture holding capacity. We've converted all of our soil now into organic soil. We're much closer to these peat type of soil behaviors, where instead of looking at um, soil that is uh, constantly uh, depleting and in need of being refilled, now we're looking at soil that's holding on to that um, water. And so Really, this is what the watershed approach is about. It's about building a giant root uh, carbon um, soil moisture account that cleans the water that comes through it and also recycles that water back up into the atmosphere. And they, these green zones can be huge. We're used to thinking about turf landscapes with deep roots at six inches, maybe 12. But when we start to find plants that are adapted to our climate, we find plants that have root zones that are you know, feet deep. And when you have a soil moisture account that's feet deep, now we're talking about something that is a really vital resource for all of our waterways. That's what feeds the creeks. That's what feeds the rivers. That's what feeds the groundwater. So simple swales will suffice. That's all we need to do in order to hold on to all of this. And then we just let these guys and their friends do the work. I said evapotranspiration is a hugely overlooked water source, so we want to make sure that we do as much evapotranspiration as possible so that we actually break that cycle, that heat island cycle that keeps the rain from coming. We want to attract rain to us, and we want that rain to be attracted as gentle rain, rain that is more predictable, more uh, managed, um, and take the energy out of the big uh, weather systems. And the way that we do that is that we have much more plant life doing its thing uh, so that we can actually enhance water supply. And then finally, if we do need to irrigate, we want to make sure it's highly efficient. And so that means that we want to utilize weather-based irrigation control and well-designed systems that are managed by professionals. And I think it's important for us to remember that we're not sacrificing any beauty when we talk about these watershed approach landscapes. They are more beautiful in my eyes because we're seeing inside of them. We understand that they're functioning in a whole different way. And it could look like anything, really. It doesn't have to just look like, you know, like 
succulents or anything else. It can look like almost anything. So the question really is, how do we implement this every single place that we possibly can? I'm going to turn it back over to Mara to talk more about specifically the ocean-friendly garden approach that we've been implementing over the past 10 years. Yes, thank you, Pam. Um, maybe you could just give me a heads up when my slide is showing with the ocean-friendly gardens on it. It is. Okay, excellent. You're with me. So, yeah, so, you know, as I said before, you know, we really looked towards, you know, finding a way that we all in our, in our own yards could really start to implement solutions for the problems that are caused by stormwater and urban runoff. And that was sort of the genesis of our Ocean Friendly Gardens program. And, and with this, we're really trying to make that connection, you know, be, between how we all care for our yards and in our public spaces and the health of our local waters waste. So if we look on the next slide, we have a, a lot of chapters implementing this program. It's, the program really started in Southern California, but it's really spread throughout Surfriders Network um, into those different coastal states that I showed you earlier. And each chapter really has a different approach to the program, different resources and, uh, that they bring to the table, as well as slightly different concerns that they're working on locally. Whereas in you know, Southern California, they, you might be working largely on <clears throat> preventing runoff and water conservation. Over in North Carolina, it might be more flooding control that is a main issue. So, but within that, there's sort of like these, these main components of the program, which is building awareness, installing projects, really providing education and training for both home, homeowners and professionals, and then advocating for positive policy changes, which will allow the watershed approach and this, uh, you know, this pro approach in general to go beyond um, our members. So if we look at the next slide, which talks about our ocean-friendly garden awareness raising goals, uh, again, this is you know building that personal responsibility and providing easy ways for everyone to be part of the solution. So we have, you know, our chapters are often out in the public at different community environmental fairs, just really talking about um, you know, what some of the easy solutions are that we can all um, take part in. You know, and more advanced than just sort of our, our tabling opportunities, on the next slide you'll see we have a lot of chapters that run um, garden tours. So the, the one photo on the left is with, the, with more people there is a garden tour in Ventura. This is a, a program by the chapter that's pretty well established and they've implemented a lot of projects locally and they have um, you know neighborhoods where you can literally walk from one yard to the next and see many different ocean friendly gardens you know in, in one tour and then you know look at what what ways and what opportunities in each yard there are for sort of storing um, rainwater using it as a resource and then looking at contrasting looking at different yards that might not be implementing those approaches you know and, and talking about you know where improvements could be made I think the photo on the right is uh, up in Monterey and then if we go to the next slide our ocean friendly gardens program in Kauai over in Hawaii has really um, set up a, a very useful partnership there with the local master garden gardener program so they they don't do the garden installations themselves, but they go and they um, evaluate yards and post ocean-friendly garden signs where the homeowner is meeting our criteria um, and following the watershed approach. And then they have uh, master gardeners come, come to these properties and invite other people who are interested in learning about it and really talk through different um, and answer questions about, you know, different ways you can care for, for instance, pests or pants plant selection, you know, watering needs, if you're, if you are going to, you know, not use the chemicals and, and to uh, follow our criteria. So that has actually uh, been a wildly successful program in only a, a couple short years that they've been working on it. 
we go to the next slide. So we've done, in over the last 10 years, we've our chapters collectively have really done a lot of projects. This is a residential yard in Oxnard, which originally you'll see on the left is just a thirsty lawn, turf lawn, that really isn't looking too good either. And then after this beautiful transformation, it's, you know, this beautiful ocean-friendly garden. It's got a lot of native plants and healthy soil as well as a nice uh, dry creek bread in the middle that's really capturing all the water that comes off the roof, slowing it down, allowing it to sink into the ground, and building that soil moisture that Pamela's been talking about. <clears throat> the next slide, again, has us in Ventura. Um, the photo on the left, where you can actively see the water um, soaking into the ground, before this transformation was made, it was just the green turf grass like the yards behind it. And very soon after the transformation, it was functioning very well. You know, as Ventura received some rain and the runoff came down into the contoured areas. And then, you know, not too long after that, not only was it functioning, but it was being beautiful and, you know, changing with the seasons, which is you know, a really nice feature and it really stands out in its neighborhood now for you know, both the function and how beautiful it is. And, you know, Pamela made that, made that point that uh, in, in order to convince people to take this leap and to give up their green turf lawns for something that might look a little bit more adventurous, you know, you really have to show how beautiful it can be. And it has to be more, at least as attractive, if not more beautiful. And I'm on Pam's side. I think it's more beautiful. So these are an example of a couple of the residential properties we've transformed um, in Ventura. But we also, on the next slide, we've also done some pretty large uh, community demonstration gardens, which are, are aimed both at solving a pollution problem, but also at really getting the attention of the entire community to show that there's a, a different way to do things beyond the traditional landscaping to um, to be, again, beautiful and to help look at our control of our stormwater. So this is a site in East Hampton, New York, and I know you see a lot of green grass. It's not California here. And the problem here is this area receives a lot of runoff from the main street. This is a central green. It's always been grass from one roadway to the next. The It's managed by, a, by the village, and it's been allowed to – being managed organically, and there's a lot of clover in amongst the, the grass. So that was a good thing, but it still would get severely flooded. And right down from this property, there's a coastal pond, which then has an outlet into one of the most popular ocean beaches in the community out here on Long Island. So when it was first planted, we really designed, we had a, a design that, it, to me, it looks like a stream of, of native plants that connects all the area that receives the stormwater runoff and, again, stops that runoff and allows it to soak into the ground so it doesn't add to flooding and pollution problems downstream at the beach. This is when um, this garden was just planted. And if we look on the next slide, this is on the left when there's the purple irises in bloom. That was literally one year later. So it was already this gorgeous planted area. And then when the, the pink flowers um, were planted on the right, that's, you know, a year and a couple of months. And if we go to the following slide, it just shows, you know, within a, within a year and a half, it really transformed. Everybody was used to looking at just this turf, you know, wall-to-wall carpeting. And now it's this gorgeous showcase of a native garden that attracts all sorts of pollinators. And it's really performing its function. The chapter here used to sample the stormwater that would uh, accumulate in this area, and the bacteria levels were always so high. Now it's really hard for us to get a sample at all because the water really does soak into the ground so much faster than it used to. So a really successful project that we've had over here in eastern Long Island. And then on the next slide, it just shows that 
you know, this program obviously has to be regional. It depends on the climate locally to be successful. The photo on the left shows the Oahu chapter, which has taken our Ocean Friendly Gardens program to both target stormwater prevention, but also to provide local sustainable sources of food. So they have a lot of fruits and vegetables growing in their ocean friendly gardens. And on the right hand side, the the chapter in Wilmington, North Carolina, again is doing ocean friendly gardens largely to control stormwater runoff, to help with flooding that happens during rain events. And they've done some projects with some local youth groups at uh, after school care type facility. Again, they're they're capture. I wish I had a better photo to show this, but they're they're capturing um, the water that falls on the roof into a cistern, and that water's used to water a vegetable garden that the kids are taking care of. And they have this rain garden native planting that makes sure that runoff from the site doesn't lead and, and pollute nearby waterways. So that's sort of their unique um, twist on the program. If we go to the next slide, um, in addition to the awareness raising and the garden installations, we also really have an emphasis on education and professional training. So this would be for professional landscapers, garden designers, as well as people who do it themselves in their own yard. So a lot of chapters hold workshops um, with, we've done these with Pam many times and, and others like her where We've really been in the classroom and looking at ocean-friendly garden designs that would work for each site and then been out in the field, you know, letting everybody get their hands dirty and really uh, experiment and learn the techniques that we use to transform yards from, you know, like that yard we saw in Ventura where we have tired-looking turf to beautiful ocean-friendly garden oases. Uh, the next site and beyond the education, we're really looking to affect positive change. There in Southern California, we have been very involved in helping to, think of the right word, helping to really steer, steer or encourage the, the counties that have been developing these turf replacement programs to follow the watershed approach, that what they're replacing the turf with is, is really better for water resources for our healthy soils and our communities in general. In, in, in San Diego and Los Angeles, we saw their turf replacement programs require the watershed approach for, you know, what people were replacing their, their turf with. You know, now we've seen that grown to cover the whole metropolitan water district. So that's been really encouraging. And Ventura, our chapter there is pretty excited. They're working on developing a ocean friendly garden design template that will be part of the model water efficient landscape ordinances that people can use um, to meet to meet those regulations and they've also worked on developing ocean friendly garden criteria specifically to apply in the areas that need to be revegetated because of the fires last year and then um, beyond that in those are, those are pretty specific to Southern California, but across the country and, and where we're really seeing this is on the East Coast is really trying, our chapters are trying to get either government-owned land or in school properties to be managed. It's not using entirely the entire watershed approach, but to do it without the, the chemicals, without the pesticides, without the fertilizers. So one of the, the biggest problems we have on this coast is... Uh, Water quality is our harmful algal blooms, and I know that's becoming problematic everywhere. But certainly, I'm um, in Florida. I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, with the problems they're having with the red tide and the blue-green algae. If you go to the next slide, our chapters there are really, really looking um, to promote ocean-friendly gardens and the watershed approach as as a solution, as something that when you get frustrated with governments and and different um, different opportunities that get lost to, to make change. We all have an opportunity, as Pam says, in our own yard to do something better. 
And then I think where we're going to leave this is on the next slide, one thing that's been really cool with our Ocean Friendly Gardens program is we've really been able to do a, a lot of projects and incorporate local schools and students in, in those projects. So we have a quick video that I think they're going to show from the office there, um, which sort of describes just how well the students working on this project get it and, and what they're trying to do to help the rest of the community get it as well. I think we can hand it over back to you. Environmental Club is installing an ocean-friendly garden at the corner of Maine and Catalina. And this spot is really important because it's visible to the community. We're here planting a garden, which we have uh, stripped of the previous plants to reinstate with new native and uh, drought tolerant plants. Uh, the plants that we're using are 90% um, California natives, uh, very low water, and they're going to have a beautiful garden that's going to replace what was just kind of a couple of weird uh, polygons of turf. Ocean Friendly Gardens, it's a really great way um, to make an environmental impact because lawns use a ton of water first of all and rather than having rainwater run off and cause pollution downstream into our oceans, waterways, etc., it will actually allow runoff to soak into the ground, basically recharge our water tables and our water systems that we get our drinking water from. I think it's great. I mean. When I was in high school, we did projects, but not like this. So um, I'm really excited to see them out here um, working really hard. <laughs> Surfrider and Ocean Friendly Gardens really wants to encourage people to change their landscapes into this kind of landscape, but we don't have a lot of examples. So it's really great to be able to have a site like this, which is so visible, so people can see what's going on. We've had a lot of people stopping by, asking you know, what we're doing or giving us a thumbs up. Um, so they're going to be able to see this garden grow in and um, see what it looks like in a year or two years. And that'll give them an example of what they can do in their own home gardens. When people go home today, I hope that what they take from this event is the feeling of, of community and unity around something that will better our future. I like seeing them out of the classroom, see them um, start digging up grass and hopefully it gets people to start thinking, well, why do I have a lawn? And I, I, I weed it, I uh, put pesticides on it, I fertilize it, I, I mow it all the time, I spend the majority of my uh, water on this lawn. Meanwhile, there's all these native plants that you could plant that su do support biodiversity, uh, you know, saving a bunch of our water too. This project will inspire our community um, by seeing the big difference that a group of really young people can make. Ventura Water is just here to help support this program and uh, encourage our schools and our residents to help conserve water through water-wise landscapes. So Pam, I think this is back to you. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, so for the people who are here and, and at home, uh, what was, as I mentioned before, the Ocean Friendly Gardens program in Ventura has been almost a decade in the making. Um, one of our first demonstration projects was there, and it has now led to this beautiful stuff that you just saw. And I wanted to also, I'm just going to flip through this and get here. So this was one of our first um, homeowners who uh, agreed to allow his property to be converted into an ocean-friendly garden. And right across the street from him is the river. So he was particularly concerned that all the water that was going off of his roof was going right into the river. And uh, he wanted to do something about that. And here we have that garden, and you saw pictures of it earlier. Uh, but here it is two years after it was installed. It doesn't use any irrigation now. It's irrigated by rainwater, and it goes into the big soil sponge, and the plants that are there utilize that water. And if there were to be any watering, because he doesn't have an irrigation system, he would have to go out in the very dry winter time. So it's the winters when we're not getting rain that these landscapes actually require more water. They don't require it in the summertime. So it's like a flip on how um, these landscapes work. 
And so after we did that project, um, G3 was actually hired by the County of Ventura to um, start working on some projects with them to help with their uh, MS4 permitting and some other things that they were uh, doing. They had some big projects that they wanted to do, and so they incorporated OFG as part of their outreach. Um, one of the first things that we did was just come up with some, uh, you know, quick stuff about what you could do to build an ocean-friendly garden, um, some step-by-steps, and just some, you know, general language stuff so that people would understand slow spread and sink. Then uh, a couple, about a year later, we actually worked with Ventura Water, the city of Ventura, um, and the county, and uh, did this project, which is another residential project, and it has two rain gardens right in the middle, one big one right here uh, on the left-hand side where you see all those plants, and a slightly smaller one here in the middle, and one, actually three, and one over here. And what I love about this, gar this rain garden is um, the entire landscape, first of all, is a rain garden. So that's something that I also wanted just to mention is unlike what happens on the East Coast where rain gardens are sort of different from landscape, here the rain garden is the landscape. Um, also, you can't tell that there's a rain garden there. It's just landscape. Um, it's just contoured. It's covered with mulch, not lots of rock and all that other stuff. Um, after we did the front here, uh, we actually got permission to come up, uh, come back and cut the curb and do two uh, curb cuts here. And uh, again, you can't even see that there's a depression there, but there's a huge depression there that's filled with mulch. And so that is all like knit together as a giant sponge. And I think I have a picture of, yeah, there it is, uh, when it rains. And that water comes in there and just fills it up and the mulch gets decomposed and compresses down and compresses down. They put more mulch in it in the dry season and then, you know, go forth. Uh, so it's not fancy. It didn't have engineered soil and, you know, didn't have any of that stuff. And it takes a huge amount of water off the street. Imagine if we did those in every single house along this street as it uh, went to the ocean. Um, another project in Ventura that we did with the county was at their county um, uh, uh, facility. And this garden has no irrigation. They couldn't irrigate it. Uh, it literally didn't have a system there. Uh, but we took out turf and we made this rain garden. Again, you can't see that it's a rain garden. It's just a garden. Uh, there is a giant stormwater um, uh, grate right here where all the water used to just run across the turf into this area. And now, instead, it goes into this. I've got a couple of quick pictures of that. This, this picture was taken in uh, September, um, and, you know, that's at the end of the summer. It should look really horrible with no irrigation, right? It looks fantastic. Why? Soil sponge, soil moisture reservoir. I mean, it's crazy it looks so good. I couldn't believe it, actually. I was very, very happy. <laughs> um, then we also did a school with the county uh, where they had a lot of flooding in the actual building. Um, and so we did this uh, little ocean-friendly garden there. And again, you can't see it because it's just a mulch depression. You see, it's just a contouring of the land with a mulch depression. It is not, also, it's not three feet deep. It's not six feet deep. It doesn't have any kind of basin in it. This is just the natural soil, native soil, enhanced with compost, mulch, native plants, contoured to a depth of maximum 12 inches, and it does its thing. And in fact, most of the ocean-friendly gardens that we're working on, we're contouring six inches. We don't want giant contours. We just want enough the water to slow down and get into the garden so it goes into the roots. It's another shot of it. So this is a project that uh, then came from that school project. There was another school project that the Ocean Friendly <laughs> Gardens program did in Ventura. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, they're just making little ponded areas. This is a little bit deeper, but it gets a lot of, um, gets a lot of runoff off of this hard surface. And then all of a sudden we started seeing other landscapes in Ventura um, in the area where we had done the previous um, gardens, and now people starting to take it on. And some of these are actually built with ocean-friendly gardens as well. Here's one uh, that has the sign. Um, 
but you can see that they're not like, they're different looking in that they're not turf, but they're not different looking in that they have to have a giant creek bed in the middle of them. They're just holding on to the rainwater with healthy living soil, climate appropriate plants, and irrigation that is highly efficient. And that's it. So we can take questions. Do we get any questions? Oh, good. Maybe there's some questions here in the room too. Yeah, I'll start with one online real quick, and then we'll look in the room. Uh, the first one online is, uh, you emphasize that compaction of soil is a big issue. Uh, what would you suggest we do to balance the need for compaction of soil, for property foundations, for buildings and pavement, and keeping soil permeable for good stormwater infiltration for plants and groundwater recharge? That's a great question. Um, well, so of course we need to compact for our building surfaces. Um, what we need to be thinking about, though, is allowing the landscape to decompact itself, really. Um, if, so we, I, ha I have a personal philosophy, which is if it's appropriate to have a garden on it, it's appropriate to hold the rainwater. Um, so uh, once, once you kind of apply that philosophy, you can see that in a landscape where you would ordinarily have a garden area, um, in order to decompact it, all that needs to be done is that oxygen, water, and life are applied in, you know, in some measure. Oxygen being the first most important thing, so it gets aerated. And how do you aerate it? Well, it depends on what the ground cover is. If it's a turf ground cover, it's aerated one way. If it's a landscape that you're going to be converting and taking out the turf, then it's going to need to have some augering done in it. It's going to need to have some holes essentially put into the landscape at various places in order to um, allow that oxygen into the soil. And um, uh, that's where you see tilling. For example, we saw that in the, in the movie. Uh, there was a tilling at the very beginning of the process, and that was basically to get the oxygen into the soil and make it more friable. But then the most important thing is compost has to be added. Compost is not nutrient. It's really, really important to understand that. There's no nutrient in compost, okay? Compost is the potential for nutrient. It's actually organic matter that's covered in biology that makes nutrient for the plant when the plant asks for it. There's nothing mobile about the nutrient in compost, in good compost. And so when you add that compost, all those critters start to go to work decompacting the soil. And then you apply water, which keeps those critters going, and plant your plants. And the plant roots will actually decompact the soil so long as there's enough oxygen in it in the very beginning and enough organic matter, enough microbes for them to start doing their thing. So that's the answer, is that the garden will decompact itself. And so wherever you're going to be having garden, no matter what, you can have a surface that is uncompacted, performs like a sponge, and you can put stormwater into it. I promised these people we would have questions. That's why we made it for 90 minutes. No questions? Yes. How much it takes to maintain them over years? Um, I don't know, Mara, if you wanted to talk at all about um, some of the costs. I can, I can start it, though. Hey, uh, how do I convince my customers? I represent a water district. How do I convince my customers to take out their lawn and put a garden in? And basically, they're going to say, how much? What do I tell them? Well, let me, so, th so there are two things uh, to think about here. The first one is we don't necessarily need to remove the grass. So... I, I know that is almost like I've just said a blasphemy in the room, um, but, but grass can be converted into ocean-friendly garden. Um, it, is a, it is a matter, again, of having oxygenated, healthy uh, soil and plant. And so if someone is really needs to keep their grass, there are ways of turning it into a... Uh, 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 
an area, a garden that is spongy soil, et cetera. You just have to do, you know, do those steps and then direct the stormwater into it or the rainwater into it. Um, so that's one thing. But then the second thing is, I think that it is, so I think personally from like a policy point of view, it's, it's kind of wrong of us to say, oh, well, the turf is the bad thing. It's more about if you are making a garden, right? If you are doing landscaping or you're making a garden or, you're, or you like what the beautiful new garden is, this is how you do it. And it can be done incredibly inexpensively. Um, it's, uh, you know, so, so, uh, so I, I, I was a landscape contractor for many years. And I would hear this from uh, water agencies saying, uh, well, you know, how do I convince people to remove the turf and do a garden? Well, if they're not, if they're not inclined to make a garden, then it's, you know, almost no amount, no, no, it could, it could, it has to be zero really to entice them to do that, right? Because they're not inclined to make a garden. But if someone is inclined to make a garden, what we need to point out is, this is no more expensive. In fact, it is less expensive to do this. So this is just landscaping. It's the same as landscaping. It's one of the biggest industries in California that there is. People are spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year in California to do landscaping. What we need to do is make sure that landscaping is ocean-friendly watershed approach. And then, secondarily, if they have turf or other systems, then we work on how do we make these other gardens so attractive that they will make an investment in it, just like getting a new kitchen or a new whatever, right? Um, but lawn itself can be very um, appropriate. It just has to be managed appropriately, and not just from an irrigation point of view, but from a turf point of view. So I kind of didn't answer it, but, but that's the thing. I mean, in the book that uh, is here, you know, we, we talk about what your investment in landscaping can be. You can spend, you know, $200 a square foot for landscaping easily, and you can spend $5 a square foot, but you can't do it for $0, right? Just doesn't happen. Yes, other questions? Um, so I, I understand you can't do anything for zero dollars, but are there any grants or public funding available for people that, I know like there was uh, the incentive for people to get, get rid of their lawn. Um, is there anything available, any kind of funding available for people that do want to convert their landscaping for, you know, this purpose? Well, Metropolitan Water District in SoCal does have a uh, rebate now for turf conversion. So it's still framed as a turf conversion, but basically it's a garden making, right? Taking out the turf and making a garden with in these in this style. But I don't know about other parts. Does Sacramento have a uh, what? How how much is it? And is it tur Is it about taking out your turf and dollar square foot? Yeah. So a dollar square foot incentive to remove the turf and do this. Oh, okay. Save our water has one. Do you want to do you want to just talk about that really quickly? So the state does have a program that they've coordinated with local agencies. Called, and this you would find it under Save Our Water, and there is still money available. And if Prop Three passes tomorrow, there will be more turf rebate programs. I have a uh, two from online. Uh, the first one, and I apologize, I might butcher this. Uh, how does ocean-friendly garden programs encourage uh, mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae. Uh, inoculation at planting time? And if so, what endo, ecto, et cetera? Mara, can I take it? Please. <laughs> uh, so uh, that is a question from someone who is trying to kind of trick us up, I think, maybe. Um, so yes, uh, there is uh, there there is no one protocol for planting. Um, 
and uh, it's all regionally based, place based, et cetera. And at the same time, most of these gardens that are going in are not predominantly grass gardens. They are predominantly sh woody shrub and tree gardens. And so there is a recommendation that in that case, uh, along with the really healthy compost and worm castings and other good biology that you could be adding, you can inoculate the woody shrubs with a broad range um, uh, inoculant. And uh, I'm not gonna name brands, but you can do the research and there are several that are excellent. And it's not a be all and end all. It's like, there's nothing in a dynamic system of a living system of a landscape that is set and forget. And you certainly aren't setting and forgetting, but you're giving a slight boost to those woody plants to kind of overcome all that compaction and all that other stuff uh, and get going. And then uh, another question, uh, with the dry creek bed design element, what is the best way to keep out weeds and burrowing rodents, organic sheet mulching approach, hardware cloth, et cetera? Uh, and then does the program encourage soil amendments beyond aeration after or during turf conversion, uh, such as adding uh, gypsum or uh, uh, to clay soil? Wow, someone, so there's someone out there. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, no, it doesn't encourage the added adding anything that's mined and so forth uh, to be added to the soil, whether it's gypsum or any other lava rock. I mean, there are a million, there are a million recipes that you can find online for uh, supposedly enhancing soil, especially clay soil. Actually, the best thing with clay soil is really, really, really good compost because clay soil is like magic soil and uh, can be turned into a beautiful sponge with, uh, with, uh, uh, com with the addition of compost. Um, but uh, in terms of um, additives and so forth, uh, well, uh, actually, so how do you keep out weeds? So uh, the best way to keep out weeds is to overcrowd them and not irrigate them in the summertime. Um, and so there is basically a prohibition on putting any kind of weed cloth in the garden, uh, whether it's under rock beds or whatever. Um, and the reason for that is it, we don't need more plastic in our landscapes. I mean, just that simple. Um, so uh, we don't use that. We use paper or cardboard underneath the, um, even the rock area in order to keep down weeds long enough for uh, the garden to get going. Um, but one, weeds need to be coppiced. That means their head cut off. They need to be cut down uh, or pulled in some cases. But remember, when you pull a weed, you disturb the soil. And so another weed's going to come to try to fix it. Weeds, basically, weeds are out there to try to fix your soil. That's why they come. So. The best thing you can do is try to get ahead of them by fixing it, by adding organic matter, by planting closely and densely with the plant material to get the plant material going, by not over irrigating or under irrigating, by making sure that there's enough water in the system, by not irrigating in the summertime so that they don't germinate while other things are taking their time and sleeping. Um, so that's how you manage weeds mostly. I think I hit everything there. And I recommend reading the book. There's lots of good stuff in the book about it. Yes? Uh, yes, so the video that showed the rolls of paper, that's um, like a butcher paper or a painter's paper that comes in rolls. You can also get in some places, like uh, it's more available in some places than others. You can get rolls of cardboard. I don't recommend buying like ram board i did use a name there but uh something like that which is very expensive product but uh paper is perfectly fine and rolling down that paper just gives a temporary um uh, uh, blocking of the sun it allows the you know it gives you the time 
for the organic matter to start to uh, get going in the soil and really start uh, getting, you know, getting things going. It just gives you that, you know, half a year, and it breaks down very easily. So that's why we want to have it in the garden because it's basically food. Cool. Emily, I have a question. Yes. How do you recommend that people kill their turf? I, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of options for killing your turf. Um, the number one option is smothering it. The picture of the guy of the Ventura, the first project that we did in Ventura, that turf was kept in place and smothered uh, by putting paper and cardboard over it, water, compost, and mulch. And so that process took some time. It was done in the summertime, but by the fall, um, it was by, yeah, by the fall, we were ready to plant. So um, that, you know, if you have time, smothering it, leaving it in place and smothering it is the best. Uh, you need to plan for it, but, um, but that's the best. Um, then there are gradations after that. So there is uh, removal. If you have a warm season grass, which is a grass that um, uh, it, uh, it basically spreads by these um, sort of underground runners, um, a warm season grass is notoriously difficult to get rid of. That you may want to cut off the um, organic matter on top, you know, the, the top uh, couple of inches and remove that. That does go to the landfill, so you need to think about that. Um, but if you do that and then and then do sheet mulching and composting over the top of the remaining earth, you can build soil that way. Um, then there, then you start to once you get past those two ways, then there is the like like less by far um, less good by far, but still not horrible um, solarization which is basically putting out a plastic onto the ground to solarize the, the um, um, soil. And what you're doing there is what it sounds like. You're baking it. You're basically using the sun's radiation to kill everything in the soil and also the grass. That is an effective way if two things. One, you don't leave the plastic on there so long that it breaks down and becomes a nasty, horrible thing. And you have a reuse for that plastic. That's one. Uh, and um, two, it needs to be followed immediately with compost. Immediately. Because what you've done, it's like, can't, it's like a radiation treatment. Right? You've killed everything. Now you've got to put the good stuff back. So that's sort of three. And then there is a way that we do not recommend, which is the application of herbicide or gly glyphosate. And just that isn't done in ocean-friendly gardening. Can you, uh, where, where can people view and download a copy of the California Watershed Approach Handbook for those that aren't in the room? Uh, there, I don't know if there is a copy um there's a copy certainly on our website greengardensgroup.com on the front page um there is also i don't know if uh the california water efficiency partnership has a link to it or not yet um calweb c-a-l-w-e-p.org you can check it out and i don't know if surfrider has one or not mara it's actually not up there yet but will certainly be on our resources tab soon. Okay, there you go. And we can put it on the uh, storms page as Perfect. well. Perfect. Perfect. That'd be great. Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone. Thank you Pamela and thank you Mara on the thank phone. You. This has been wonderful. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Thank you.